evening and welcome to another edition of Nevada County Interviews. I'm your host, Paul Manacucci, and uh, we have a very exciting uh, show this evening. Uh, I have with me in the studio uh, three doctors and my co-host on Traumatic Brain, Cindy Shaw. Thank, Thank you for being here. Daniel Goldsmith. Hello. Uh, Michael Jensen. And uh, Neva Managali Lake. Yes. And we're each of uh, the docs on this show tonight have a different uh, specialty, so we'll get into that in a minute. Before we go on with the questioning, uh, I, I do want to take a second to sort of set the stage. This is the second part of what's planned to be a six part uh, investigation of traumatic brain injury. Um, the reason we're undertaking this series is because we think um, that, uh, based on a lot of research we've done, that uh, traumatic brain injury really is a silent epidemic. Um, it's just virtually uh, unknown in the general population, and, uh, and uh, fortunately for us, I think, uh, the National Football League uh, notoriety has really all of a sudden taken this uh, subject to the surface, and so we want to make sure that we can um, develop a series that educates the uh, community uh, and um, really can influence in some way or at least get information to policymakers about what you know what is it that we should be doing with traumatic brain injury. It's it's very often something that is difficult to diagnose. Uh, treatment plans go for any anywhere from you know six visits to you know a lifetime. Um, so there's a lot of issues that surround traumatic brain injury. So we're going to get into that. And that that's kind of why uh, we want to do it. I also wanted to mention that um, when I was working in the legislature. I was the uh, committee consultant to the Senate uh, Subcommittee on Aging and Long-Term Care, Subcommittee of Health Care, of uh, the Health um, Committee. And um, we had a bill in 1996, a long time ago, to try to address some of the issues of traumatic brain injury and um, also to look at benefits and uh, training uh, and uh, resources for family members because uh, somewhat like Alzheimer's, the primary um, treatment um, network is really the family, uh, which is, as we'll find out, both a good thing and a bad thing. So, uh, Cindy, welcome back. Thank you. Um, we're going to do the impossible here. We're going to have you do what was an hour show in about three minutes. <laughs> Give the people at home a little overview of what it is traumatic brain injury is, and um, kind of looking at the from the brain perspective, um, how do we, what tools do we use to diagnose it, and that kind of thing. Okay, so what I have here is the brain, and it's been taken out of the skull, you can see, and it's not real. But what we're talking about usually are accidents. So it could be um, an accident that happens uh, during football, during a sports uh, event, soccer, water polo, etc. Usually it's a car accident. Um, it can be a motorcycle accident, it could be a pedestrian being hit by a car, it could be a fall from a grain. So it's a, an acceleration, deceleration event where the brain um, is hit and then there's a coup and the contra coup. So it's hit on one side and then, um, and then there's a trajectory where it, it actually influences the other side too. Um, as well, you have kind of a, a rotational effect that can happen um, as a result with the entire three pound brain resting on a teeny tiny brain stem. So um, there's different mechanisms of in injury and then you have the um, problem of the diffuse axonal damage that um, until recently wasn't really acknowledged too much but I think with digital photography and, and some of the things going on we're seeing a lot more with injury that's more um, microscopic. So usually you're going to hit uh, the front of your head, say in a car accident, so the brain oops, doesn't fall apart. That can happen. You lose your brain. Yeah. Um, hits hits the forehead. That's usually the mechanism, and then so then you're hitting onto the frontal lobe here. And the thing about um, the skull, if I can, this is not real, but on the inside you'll see a lot of bony protuberances. So typically you can have a little impaling here in the frontal lobes and other places where the bones are sticking out inside the skull. So that can cause problems too. Um, the kind of problems you usually see with a traumatic brain injury are things that can't be seen with the eyes. 
Um, you will get loss of attention, memory loss, headaches, ringing in the ears, dizziness, things like that. So a constellation of symptoms that will come about. Very good. Um, and can you set the stage for our viewers? We have three doctors here. Can you sort of just en encapsulate what the differences are in their specialties and when they might come in contact with someone who has had a TBI? Okay, so Very let's... briefly, and then we're going to talk more, much more in-depth about what each doctor does. Okay, so let's say, for example, we have a car accident. Somebody gets hit on, on Highway 49, and then um, they come in through the emergency room, and then they may have first contact with Dr. Goldsmith, and he may evaluate the patient at, at that point, and then make recommendations accordingly. Mm -hmm. um, and according to the protocol, I'm not sure, but perhaps follow up with the primary care physician, which would be uh, Dr. Monagati Lake, and checking with your physician and, and talk to them about what's what's happening at that point. Are your symptoms resolved? You know, maybe you're feeling a little hazy. No, that's fine. Um, have any trouble at work? No, no problem at all. Or, you know, I just can't seem to remember things. I have this headache that just won't go away. I seem to be losing my temper a lot with my husband. Those sorts of things. And then Dr. Lake. Um, may make referrals from there, including to uh, perhaps Dr. Jensen if she thinks it's appropriate, and then Dr. Jensen would look at all these different aspects and make appropriate referrals, you know, specifically regarding the head injury and rehabilitation. And then you may or may not um, get into the fray here. I take it that Dr. Jensen might refer people to you for various kinds of treatment? If, if the patient has the kinds of problems that I can help with, um, cognitive problems, perhaps behavioral problems, those would be two primary areas. Where else might you uh, refer people to? Um, perhaps a neuro-ophthalmologist, perhaps an occupational therapist who might specialize in getting back to activities of daily living or working on dizziness factors, vestibular problems. Um, you might, we, you might refer to an orthopedic surgeon too, right? If there were some orthopedic injuries that still needed to be taken care of, pain issues. Neuropsychologist. Mm -hmm. Neuropsychologist for testing, in-depth yeah. testing. Now, uh, let me ask a question of, of all of you, and then I'm going to start with uh, Dan. Um, where's the neurologist in all of this, or tends to be? And, I, and the reason I bring that up, I'll, be, I'll lay my cards on the table. When we were dealing with the uh, issue in the legislature, um, the, the most difficult group I had to convince that TBI was a real thing was um, neurologists seemed not to want to deal with TBI as the diagnosis. They, they wanted to parse out what part of the you know, neurological system had been damaged and treat that. Is that something you, you, you find, or, is it, or am I off base? I think neurology plays a key role um, in the initial diagnosis of a brain injury. Neurologists, especially in the more complicated brain injury, is there to be able to do a good focal neurological exam, be able to help assess direct urgent care that needs to be done. Physical medicine and rehab physiatry, which is my specialty, does more of the rehabilitation end of the brain injury. So we take care of um, the issues that come up and help move patients along after the initial insult. So at some point a neurologist wouldn't be in, in the mainstream of the treatment plan? Not as, not as often, only if there's more complicated issues or things that aren't looking like everything's fitting together. And I think one of the issues that have come more to light in recent years has been uh, the emphasis on psychosocial um, impacts. Uh, and treating the, not only the patient but the family. Is that something that we, that we could say is now becoming part of a treatment regimen? I, I think that's something that is clearly uh, needed. It's, it's hard to address. For example, when we did have rehabilitation centers and we were able to treat a patient more intensely, we could bring the family into that as a team. So it wasn't just one person dealing with the entire family and all the dynamics that go on. Now, and in our community, that is a little bit more difficult, although I think we probably all try to include the family as much as possible and educate them about some of the problems that they may see at home so that they can bring that, help bring that to the attention of the doctor and uh, get proper guidance. But there's, there's a lot to do. Right. 
Uh, and, and again, that's why it's a frustrating um, diagnosis to deal with from a number of perspectives. And I've been told by people in the insurance industry one of the primary barriers to you know doing better reimbursement really comes from that perspective. Is what we're we talking about here? You know, we're talking about a physical ailment. Where's the social psycho? When is this going to end? Kind of thing. And you know, when you can't do that, you end up in this. A basket of that's not an insurable event, so we can't really provide insurance coverage. And that's something I think our policymakers are going to have to address at some point because, sure, you know, between a double shotgun whammy of you know, Alzheimer's on one hand, TBI on the other, you know, seemingly increasing nature of those two uh, conditions and diseases really just spells trouble for our system, I think. So, Dan, um, I think the large part of TBI population is going to come through your door of the emergency room physician because people have been in an accident and, and so that's probably, I don't know, is that the majority of cases, do you think? I would say that a large number, if not the large right. majority, come in initially through the emergency department right. uh, from uh, an accident which can range from a car accident, sporting event. Uh, we see a lot of people uh, at home falling, uh, uh, building decks, uh, building fences. I've seen so many different types mm -hmm. of head injuries. It's, uh, right. I've done almost all of those. But not <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me, let me pitch a hypothetical to you. Let's suppose there's a woman who's 32 and she's in a car collision. Uh, and she comes in through the emergency room. She may have some abrasions, perhaps a um, minor break in her forearm. She's complaining of pain in her left forearm. Uh, she doesn't think she's lost consciousness. Uh, the airbag did deploy, uh, but she's having some blurred vision. Where would you take that set of symptoms um, from there? What would you ask her? What, what kind of uh, you know, examination would you then pursue? Some of the important questions uh, are, are I, I guess, initially you look for signs of an injury. Is there trauma to the head? Is there swelling? Is there bleeding from a uh, laceration? Uh, you, you talk to the paramedics about how did the car look? Was there a uh, starring of the windshield where her head may have hit that even with an airbag going off? Was the steering wheel bent at the top where she may have hit it with her head? Uh, intrusion of the car, the, the top of the car could have come down if it rolled over. There's many different things you talk to the paramedics about first examine the patient and questions that you would ask her if she remembers the event. There's a lot of amnesia that goes with head injuries and uh, they may not remember the details of what happened. Um, and then the variety of acute symptoms from headache, nausea, vision changes, uh, the memory loss, uh, loss of consciousness. And that's not always apparent. The patient doesn't always know they lost consciousness. Right. They may not remember the event, they just remember they ended up in the hospital. Right. And they were, uh, they were definitely conscious during when the paramedics were there maybe and when they were with us, but they don't remember that. So right. um, loss of consciousness, unless somebody from the outside can confirm that, right. they don't I was going to say, when I was doing my work in, in this field, there were actually two cases where the person didn't know they had had a head injury. They woke up, uh, you know, um, leaning against a lamppost or something. It was only through surveillance cameras or witnesses that you actually found out the person got hit by a car and they got back up and were dusting themselves off and all of a sudden they become aware of people around them. Well, what happened? You know, and then they didn't know at all what happened. You know, it leads me to believe. And the other case was person. Uh, didn't know and, you know, had gone to her uh, primary care physician, it was only through a surveillance camera that they saw what happened. She'd slipped on the hallway and hit her head. And she just not, she had no knowledge of it, you know, having a TBI. So it could be a really difficult uh, question even for the patient. So um, you mentioned the swelling in the brain. That's, of course, something very dangerous. Uh, how would you, as an emergency room physician, deal with that? Swelling in the brain uh, is a pretty significant injury. You notice that, say, first on a CAT scan. And usually there are significant symptoms associated with that. When, when would you call for a CAT scan? Anytime that I am concerned of a significant uh, head injury. So if there's evidence from the mechanism, the symptoms, trauma to the, uh, the head or face, uh, and you're concerned that there could be you know, in, intracranial injury uh, fairly frequently. 
Now, uh, sometimes uh, some emergency room physicians have said to me, it's a difficult thing because a, a patient may come in with some major injury uh, as part of a car crash, and then what happens is they treat that, and the focus is on that, and they don't really get around to treating, you know, or asking the kinds of questions. The patient, person may be unconscious, for example, um, or they may be bleeding so bad from something that they need to go into uh, surgery. Is that something that happens on a regular basis, or is that uncommon? In a major trauma center, that would be fairly common, is that people would come in, um, they could be altered in their mental status, they may not be uh, making sense, uh, confused about what happened or more. They may be intoxicated, so you can't always know that right away. You don't know the extent of their, their head injury or if it's caused by some other type of issue. And uh, they have some other major injury. They have a femur fracture or an open fracture or internal injuries that need surgery. Yeah. You still have to, and that becomes a very complicated issue with trauma. Someone is bleeding inside their abdomen. They need to go to surgery right away. They also could have a head injury. Right. They could have an injury bad enough that would need neurosurgery too. Do you spend the time getting a CAT scan while they're bleeding inside or take them to the operating room? And that is uh, an, a discussion that happens in trauma centers frequently, and it is, there are no good answers to that. Right. It yeah. is a clinical uh, decision made. Every case is different, and uh, multiple doctors are going to be involved with that. And uh, it is difficult. And, um, so let's take the case of this 32-year-old woman. She's not that badly injured, and you're about to... You, you, you don't think she has anything worse than some abrasions and, you know, maybe, maybe a contusion, but there's nothing, no bleeding or, you know, there's no bones broken. So you're going to be releasing her. What, what are you telling her about her primary care physician? Well, in uh, her case, she has some evidence of, of head injury. Uh, I would have done a CT scan on her, I believe, and... Uh, if there was no evidence of brain injury that needs neurosurgical intervention or uh, admission to the hospital, she could go home. Her risk of having a bad problem like further bleeding within the brain or uh, not waking up uh, if she goes to sleep and such is very unlikely uh, in her case. So she could go home safely. But she has to understand that she has had an injury to her head. And she may not remember all of this. She may be talking to me, having a conversation, seeming very awake and alert. You ask her two days later, what did you talk about in the hospital? She says, I really don't remember being there. Right. That's not uncommon. So someone has to be there to, you can't release her on her own. Some family member, friend, somebody who's going to be able to take the instructions and uh, take her home and be uh, uh, able to watch her and make sure she's not uh, getting worse, falling down. Re-injuring her head uh, in the next few days or so, so uh, she uh, she needs some assistance, and then she needs to be followed up uh, if she has some symptoms of a head injury. Those may resolve completely in two to three days; they may not. She needs follow up to confirm that. Her primary care doctor would be the best one to to see her. Again. How, how do you shepherd that link between you being a, a emergency room doc and her primary care physician? Is there anything you can be doing or what? I mean, a lot of times, again, you know, people don't want to go to the doctor if they don't have to. Right. Like, so, you know, I'm going home and yeah, I got a little headache, but that's to be expected. I got a bonk on the head. Um, is there any follow up if, do you know, for example, if she doesn't go to her primary care physician? I don't have that kind of follow up because uh, the primary care uh, physician may be out of the area. Some people have doctors in Auburn or other areas and we don't all have a, uh, a method of communicating uh, back results, say, if she does go to her primary care and what the results were. So, um, but you the, would make the referral. You I would definitely make a referral. You would advise the person to go and right. see their doctor right. within a week or two weeks. A week would be reasonable mm -hmm. to see. Uh, most symptoms from a milder head injury will resolve within a week, but uh, that's a good time to know if things are not improving. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, if they need further follow-up with a, a rehabilitation person or um, just other other therapies, and then uh, one way to make that clear to people is to explain how serious a head injury or brain injury is. That um, it's more severe than we used to think, and that there are complications later on that can be uh, 
moderate term, weeks to months, to even long term or permanent. And mm -hmm. that uh, early reevaluation is important. So letting them know that, letting them know that re injury to the head is very uh, severe in, the, in the, within the week or two after an initial head injury. And how urgent is it? Suppose I miss this appointment in my, you know, I wait until it gets a little bit worse, a headache gets a little bit worse, and I see my primary care physician two months down the road. Do you think significant damage is being done in that delay? I don't think physical damage to the brain is being done, but uh, ability to provide therapy and intervention early has been lost. Mm -hmm. And so there's that two-month period now that has been uh, not uh, used for for therapy, which may have been more beneficial earlier than later. Mm -hmm. Okay, well now we're going to suppose that uh, the uh, you know that this person went to her primary care physician. Now I've got another guy um, for you, Aniva. She's uh, this is a gentleman of 62, and uh, he's playing softball. Um, this is a personal story. <laughs> I actually ducked and didn't get hit in the head. With <laughs> Otherwise, this is a true story. Um, so, a bat was thrown by mistake, and this um, gentleman happened to get hit in the head. He uh, never lost consciousness. Um, he has a bruise on his head, uh, and um, you know he 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 didn't think he was that injured. Uh, but now he's having trouble concentrating, and he's noticed that he can't keep his temper under certain uh, uh, under certain pressures and frustrations. And he also notes that his boss said, "Jim, you're you know you're not okay. Uh, your productivity seems to be down. Um, are you something going on at home or something?" So uh, let's say he's a stockbroker, and he um, you know he feels like he doesn't get better. That uh, this kind of sequential. Uh, numerical uh, understanding he has to have in his job is going away. He can't remember advice he gave to his uh, clients. So he comes into your office. H how do you treat him? What are you, what kind of records would you get normally uh, to look at? Let's suppose he had a CAT scan at the at the hospital. Uh, where do you go from here? Well, we would start with um, taking a history, as always in medicine. And so talking with him and asking him questions about. Uh, did he have any symptoms before his injury? I'm assuming we would know about his injury, that he had told me about that. And um, getting a baseline for what his, uh, his normal state is, and, and then asking him about different areas of functioning. So, for example, his, um, his work situation, what does he normally do? Is he having trouble in that arena? Is he having trouble with his emotions at home, perhaps, or at work? Um, physical symptoms, is he still having headaches, is he, is he having trouble sleeping, um, so we would look at physical symptoms as well. And then doing a physical exam, a neurologic exam, um, and also getting old records, getting records from the emergency room if he did have studies, if he had a CAT scan, seeing what the emergency room doctor wrote when, when he was, if he did go to an emergency room, if he had a visit. Many times if it's an injury like this, people don't go. Well, and case. if he didn't in this case, then that's not anything that we could uh, have access to. So um, doing that kind of evaluation and then uh, further evaluation um, probably would warrant a CAT scan at that point if there's mental status changes mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, Changes that we could we could do, for example, um, some neuropsychiatric testing. What would that be like? Uh, we do have some practitioners in the area that are um, PhD psychologists who do neuropsychiatric testing, which is a very detailed exam, usually about four hours, where they do complex uh, tasks such as, as math, memory testing, concentration. Um, so and would that be a referral you would make? That would be a referral that I would make uh -huh. um, if, if I felt it was warranted. Sometimes we also do some simple testing in the office uh, to get an idea. We can do what's called a mini mental status exam where we have, there's about 20 questions that we ask patients. Mm -hmm. um, we do this for dementia screening as well. Um, that helps us have an idea of what we're, what kind of, limitations we're talking about with cognitive functioning. So these are the, some of the things we could, we could think about in, in the evaluation. 
and then also uh, making a referral to a specialist such as a neurologist for further testing um, or a physiatrist like Dr. Jensen for uh, input. What so, would you have to know to make a um, referral to a neurologist? What kinds of, and, and there's different levels of, of brain injury, right? There's a severe, moderate, what's the mild? mild? Um, how do you know where they fall in there, and how, what, you know, when do you say, okay, this is a, uh, um, you know, moderate head injury? Is there a difference between who you would refer people to based on that uh, diagnosis? Perhaps uh, for starters, if 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 it was mild, um, just starting with the neuropsychiatric testing because you're wondering, is there really some deficits here? Is there not? Um, usually, people are if people are coming to you. They usually don't recognize things. So if they actually end up in the office, that's your first clue. This is worse than, than they're actually saying. Um, sometimes you need to get some input from the family. I do have patients who are brought in by their family members, you know. Who, Tell me about that. Uh, I, I, I well, they're that. always, you know, a little bit humorous because, you know, um, <laughs> you know, it's like Alzheimer's patients are like this too. Well, I don't have any problem with my memory. I just am a little forgetful sometimes, and the husband's over here going, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's bad, you know. And then, well, what about, you know, you put the, you know, you didn't, uh, I don't know, you put your keys in the, Refrigerator, and, so you know. Got, I mean, they got lost. or they got lost, and they've been lost, you know, ten times in the last week, and the bills are not getting paid, and you know, the water's going to be shut off, and so you you do get some very interesting history from family members. Um, also, um, you know, someone's getting up and wandering at night, or somebody is um, really has a different personality now and is being uh, very irritable or having anger outbursts or. Um, changed personality, and the, and the patient is not aware of it, and uh, it's hard for them to believe. Sometimes you have to, you know, interview the pa family members separately. So those are all things you have to be aware of, and 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 when you're taking that history, uh, be clued into that. Right. And then if it's mild, usually starting with perhaps a brain scan, uh, perhaps doing the neuropsychiatric testing, and that will give you some good information. Uh, perhaps it's just and mild, and then we could make a referral to uh, Cindy for you know some speech therapy, cognitive um, therapy, and that may be enough. Maybe the patient needs some medication uh, to help them sleep at night or to uh, help their mood be a little more stable. Um, if it's more moderate, um, then usually we need to get the neurologist involved, um, the, the physi physiatrist involved, definitely. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I'll ask you a couple of difficult questions here. Um, is the treatment that a person who's on Medicaid, is there, are they going to get the same treatment that somebody has uh, private insurance, do you think? Uh, I don't think that's a difficult question. Um, I don't think they're going to get as good a treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, Why is that? The referrals, trying to get the, um, the tests you need ordered, paid for, uh, are prob that's going to be very difficult. Um, I have even private patients recently, I've tried to make a referral for this neuropsychiatric testing, and it was very difficult how we had to word the coding for, uh, I believe this was a Medicare patient, not Medi-Cal. And uh, the PhD person was telling me, you know, we have to kind of code it this way, hopefully it'll work. If not, you know, they'll have to pray, play, pay privately. So this is a very difficult area uh, that we are, that we live with here, right. and we so, don't have a lot of resources in our community. You know, we have UC Davis, but that's not an easy system to maneuver to get into sometimes. Right. And one of the things that I found when we were dealing with the, this issue uh, and taking a lot of history from people that uh, it's it's almost um, impossible for somebody who's like living alone, who may be sixty years old to function at this point, you know? They don't know what to ask. Uh, the primary care physician may have made some referrals that got denied, you know, and then what happens, you know? This person, uh, if they don't have a family to bring them back around to the doctor, uh, sometimes they just drop off the, the, the end of the table. Um, how common is that, do you think? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure how common it is. Um, 
but it's it's not a good situation because um, it's difficult to maneuver around in the world of medicine without an advocate. And when people are not feeling well, either physically or they're emotionally not well, or um, you know having symptoms like this this what we're talking about, they're not in the best shape to be their own advocate and be able to make phone calls and you know make those kinds of um, do those things that they need to get this care. So then it falls back on the physician and, you know, that may not happen because we also don't know what to do right. sometimes. So it is very difficult if you don't have patient advocates, you know, family members who are willing to spend some time and push and get these people where they need to go. Right. So it's very would, frustrating. You would say that there are um, not uncommon instances where people will be denied coverage um, partly because insurance is just, you know, not extensive enough for, you know, Cadillac insurance. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so let's suppose we a more uh, bright picture here. You you think that this is uh, this person, this gentleman, uh, is is uh, had a, suffered a moderate head injury with the bat, um, and so you're going to decide that you want to send him to Dr. Jensen, partly because he's here. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Um, um, so, how, how does that work? What, what, how do you make that referral? Uh, and on what, what basis? How would you determine well, if he's the right doctor to see him next? Well, if I had done my history and my physical and maybe done my CAT scan and perhaps done this neuropsychiatric testing and the, the neuropsychologist said, yes, there's definitely evidence of, you know, some cognitive areas that are not right some, and pointing to um, the brain injury, uh, the referral process is very simple. I just um, fill out a form and, and uh, fax it over, and then Dr. Jensen's office calls the patient and gets them in to see Dr. Jensen, and we send over my reports, you know, the neuropsychiatric testing reports, the CAT scan results. So usually when that process all works well, which it does most of the time, uh, the, the specialist has the information they need to adequately assess the patient, and then the real work of the rehab begins. Then he can decide, oh, we do need to see Cindy, or we uh, need some other, you know, intervention. And at this point, until you hear otherwise, are you, is this not on your radar screen, or how would it become? I mean, let's suppose you haven't heard from this person in six months and you thought they had a moderate uh, injury, what would you do? So you mean in my office, do yeah, I have I mean, some you, mechanisms? You, you haven't seen this person, and you may be reviewing records or something, you know. Uh, certainly my doctor does. I can't get away with not seeing it, but that often. So, I mean, you, you realize, oh, my goodness, this person who had a moderate brain injury has not gotten back to me. wonder what happened to him. Does that ever happen? Um, it does happen. People don't follow through. They have all kinds of reasons. They uh, don't want to bother. They don't think they really have a problem. They don't have the money. They don't have transportation. There's lots of issues. Can your office intercede and advocate? Definitely. Um, we And then we do, of course, get reports from our specialists. So, for example, when I send this patient to Dr. Jensen, I will get a report back that says, I'm in, you know, this is my treatment plan, this is what I'm going to be doing. Um, Suppose you disagree with the treatment plan. The Dr. Jensen doesn't have <laughs> That's pretty rare that I disagree with well, my specialist no, treatment doctor. plans. <laughs> um, I suppose I could always pick up the phone and say, you know, um, I'm just a little concerned that maybe this won't work, or um, I don't think he's going to follow through with this, or do we have some other options, or... I've heard uh, several cases where there was a dispute between a neurologist, in this particular case was neurology, and that they didn't think that this was, you know, that the evidence was there to justify mm -hmm. that kind of treatment. I think we can always ask for a second opinion, and I have my patients do that all the time. If uh, the patients will come back to me and say, "I don't, I don't agree with this, or I don't want to do this treatment, or I want this surgery," and the doctor is saying, "I don't need it," and we do have that luxury where we can send patients for a second opinion. We can send them down to UC Davis or another facility and, and, and get another opinion, and we do that a lot. And, and then we have to look at that again 
Uh, okay, now we have two opinions. Maybe they're the same. Maybe they're different. What do you want to go with? Where do you want to go from here? Yeah. Again, that takes a lot of um, it takes a lot of energy and a lot of um, um, savvy. Right. So, if patients are not in a good state emotionally, physically, it's, sometimes it's hard. Now, we know Cindy does some other things. I like run some groups. Do you ever uh, recommend uh, people go into some kind of uh, group? Yes, we have um, some wonderful support groups in the community that usually are centered at the hospital. So um, I do think that sometimes the best therapy the patients get is in, you know, uh, support group settings. Uh, they, there's a lot of teaching that goes on and um, just a lot of support among other patients, you know, about how to handle family situations and... Um, uh, so I do think that's really important, and I, I do try to make those referrals when they're appropriate. So, Mike, you've got this referral. This person comes into your office. First tell us what a physiatrist is. What's your scope of practice? You know, I get that question just about once or twice a week. So I have to put pamphlets out because people say, are you a physiatrist, physiatrist? And I kind of use the generic term, I'm a uh, physical medicine rehab doctor. So I'm a rehab doctor, and, and we deal with the musculoskeletal system. We deal with neurological injuries that need rehabilitation issues. So we do specialize a lot with those who have had, whether it's neurological from a spinal cord injury to a brain injury to stroke from a neurological standpoint, and then from more of a, a musculoskeletal, whether it's spine or joints or other related injuries. How long, is it, you know, if there is such a thing as an average treatment span, I mean, how, how many visits, how long a period of time that somebody might have had a moderate um, brain injury um, but that doesn't have any other, you know, drastic physical needs, how long a treatment plan do you uh, require or regimen would you do? Well. And that's a good question, as I was listening to you ask um, Dr. Monagati Lake those same questions. I think it's important to understand that the severity of a brain injury can really determine, number one, how much access they'll get to care, and number two, whether there's a consensus of the need for that access to care, even within the different medical specialties and, and professions that we have. So when you look at a severe brain injury, and oftentimes a moderate brain injury, these patients are usually significant enough that they have needed to be monitored in a hospital, have pretty significant deficits from a functional standpoint. So we're talking difficulty maybe communicating, swallowing, controlling their bowel and bladder, moving, moving about. And they tend to be moved into what's called an acute rehabilitation facility. And they may stay there from anywhere from a couple days to several weeks before they are discharged home. And that's oftentimes when they come home from a more moderate or severe brain injury that then they start establishing with their family physician and referrals come into us as right. physiatry. Right. There's the other aspect of where there's a more mild traumatic brain injury, and that's where we see a majority of brain that's injuries. That's what I was go to next. So let's suppose that this person didn't have a moderate brain injury, but they had a mild. That was you know, the, the diagnosis you're given. What, what happens in those cases? Where do we go with that? Well, oftentimes by the time they get come to see me, they've had their symptoms or they've had their injury that's oftentimes been months, um, weeks to months, and, and things just aren't settling down. A majority, 80 to 90 percent of people with mild traumatic brain injuries will resolve on their own within anywhere from a two to six week period. It's that subset of patients that we have the problems with that are starting to have the difficulties. They have a normal, neuro, say, focal neurological mm -hmm. exam. You, they can track, there's no f imaging studies that show abnormalities, but they have more of these, what we call higher level executive functioning. They have difficulty concentrating. And so some of these patients, if treated and, and gotten early enough, can get intervention where we'll need maybe speech therapy, whether we need some visual perceptual deficits um, corrected where um, occupational therapy can play in a role, and we can direct them into therapies quicker and sooner in that direction. And it helps them not so much get over the brain injury quicker, but helps them adapt to their symptoms while the brain is healing in that manner. So when we look to say, are there specific proven strategies that are going to make their brain injury go away. No, we don't have those, but what we do have is we have strategies that can help people adapt while their brain is going through the healing process on its own. And that's that subset of population in the mild traumatic brain injury that I, that I get concerned about. And they, if they get lost, 
what happens is then you see a whole sequel of events from family members and work issues or school issues come up. Right. So let's take the case where a person, um, you know, Nevis diagnosed as a, a, as a mild brain injury, uh, and this insurance company goes over this guy's records and they say, aha, uh -huh, you know, I noticed that when he was in college, he had a concussion playing lacrosse, and uh, we think this is a you know, pretty existing condition. His symptoms are, you know, not caused by that event. Does that happen? Not as much as it used to, and there's a couple reasons for that. Number one, a lot of insurance companies that I find dealing with brain injuries don't have, unless you, if you're within a group like, uh, you have group insurance, for example, they can't say you had a pre-existing condition, we're not going to treat that. So they're automatically included. It's people who have to go out and buy private insurance that if they didn't report down that they had a, a brain injury or something that was going on per se, that that's when you tend to see some problems with insurances coming in and saying, nope, we're not accepting that diagnosis um, because we found that there was a pre. It doesn't occur as much as we would think. Where I think the problem comes more with insurance standpoint is when someone needs ongoing therapy or cognitive rehab where they say, you know what, they had 12 visits in their plan when they signed up. They're done with those 12 visits. And, um, so they're, they're healed. They're, they're supposed to be healed. And they're as good as they're going to get. Exactly. Right. right. And that's where we have more problems. Right. And what about, what about uh, the Medicaid person? Big problem. Mm -hmm. And basically it's to access um, to insurance. In fact, um, in the community, there is very little access to specialists with Medi-Cal um, in the area. So you take someone who has a mild traumatic brain injury, and by the time a referral comes to a specialist, they may have been dealing with this for several months. They may be out of a job. They may not be able to work. Finances may be very tough. And now you have to get them from somewhere like the little town of Washington into UC Davis or down into Roseville. That becomes very difficult, and um, oftentimes when you have mild brain injuries, um, you don't see the need for all the treatment all the time. And so if you don't have someone and you say, I'm going to have to drive an hour and a half down and an hour and a half back, I'm not sure I'm going to get much out of that visit. Mm -hmm. And so they kind of neglect treatment is what happens. Now, Dan, let me ask you a question, uh, going back to the emergency room situation. We have a young man who comes in um, and... Um, he, he's had an accident and maybe has a, you, you, you might think he's a mild um, brain uh, injury. Um, but you noticed when you're asking him questions that he actually was a football player. He had a concussion uh, a month ago. Do you treat that person any differently? Well, you let them know there's uh, a higher risk. Repeated head injury is uh, it's something that we've really found more recently in the past 10 or 15 years that repeated head injury is uh, a bigger issue than, uh, than we used to think. Uh, you, you don't treat each individual uh, head injury as a separate event. They add up over time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're finding out football players, a lot of uh, uh, physical contact sports, uh, boxing. Not, not even talking about the, the unreported <laughs> Right, exactly. A whole other issue we're going to get into on the show because I know as a high school football player, um, you know, that... Uh, if I'm looking for a scholarship and this is my way out, the last thing in the world I'm going to do is to tell my coach, you know what, I've got blurred vision, I'm going to fake it. Uh, and, you know, this is where I think you know, the medical community has to be able to come in and assert itself a little bit more for the protection of that youngster because they're not dealing, you know, already it's a stack deck against them. And, uh, you know, they'll, 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 you know, more often than not, uh, I think, lie to themselves, you know. Right. So we need to uh, be vigilant there. So, okay, so Mike has then said, you know, I think, Cindy, you, you could be helpful here with some speech pathology. Uh, this is what's indicated. And you refer, you get this referral, what happens? So we're talking about, say, the 60-year-old that comes in? Yeah. Um, well, a starting place is to just listen and, and find out what's going on. So I was talking about his job and how he's having difficulty multitasking, can't do it anymore, has to do one thing at a time how the sounds are so amplified now that he can hardly stand to be in his workplace, so he either has to use earplugs or kind of find a little place to work that's quiet and can't organize what he's doing. 
So we Can I stop you for a second? Is this a, is, is ADD, and the, uh, you know, the American Disabilities Act, is that ADA, does that come into play here at all? Suppose, suppose the boss says, you know what, you're a malingerer. You know, you're not just, you know, you should be doing better than you are. I, I think it depends on the boss. I've had, we've had some employers who will make modifications. They really prize the employee. They kind of understand what's going on, and they'll make those modifications. But in a lot of cases, the person ends up losing their job under the guise of something else, or they just can't do the job, and then they're headed for disability because they can't, they just can't do it. All right, so now you're... So you have this person, and, and you, get, you get the information, and then we, we start backtracking to the home and the relationships and those sorts of things, and we usually find out that they're not eating regularly, they're not sleeping regularly, so that's the starting point. Mm -hmm. Eating and sleeping, and so if it's the sleeping, then you know they need to go to their physician and talk to their physician about the sleep and see if the physician can help. And well, I've never taken pills before. I'm not about ready to start. And you send them back to the physician for that. But we can work on developing a schedule so that they be sure that they eat. Their, they might go until five o'clock and forget that they haven't eaten. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a starting point. And then getting, having them look at some routines to make sure that if they do things at the same time every day, that those things will actually get done. And then if you start delving into how is it going you know, with your family and your relationship, then you might find out things aren't so rosy. Mm -hmm. um, and you might ask permission for their husband or their spouse to come in, and then you find out all sorts of things that you didn't know. Um, and then maybe you're looking at counseling, so you might ask the doctor to make a referral for counseling. Um, and I, I, still, I told Cindy off camera that when I had my uh, work group, um, the joke was, how do you know you're in the house of a, a TBI person? It's because all the walls are punched out. So, <laughs> <laughs> that was their version of it, but you know, all right, and that's that's a good, uh, you know, really good point. So you may have to really, you know, in order to get to the bottom of this, is to how severe this is and what the behavioral problems are, to call in the family. Does that ever create in of itself create problems and tensions? You mean calling the family in? Yeah, they're in well, there. They just won't come in. <laughs> yeah, well, sometimes, and I was going to get to that, but what, what, you know, the family is pretty assiduous about this, but the patient themselves doesn't want to deal with that. Um, usually we can convince them because they're pretty messed up and they realize that, that, that's their, that that's their team. And if we use that, we talk about the team. The team is your doctor and your family. And then if we have a psychologist, then we can talk about a team approach. This isn't just about you because, of course, it has that ripple effect and it's affecting the children, it's affecting the job, it's affecting anybody who really comes in contact with that person. Right. We've talked uh, before about the fact that we may have as high as 80% divorce rate in these cases. Um, so, I mean, really, we'll unmask if you have an underlying problem or issue, and all of a sudden you have this cantankerous person. I mean, it, it's, it's not a good situation. That's true. Yeah, so what do you do? I mean, how do you help them? I mean, would you then step in and really um, be a little bit more assertive about joining a group, for example? Or? Well, you have to be ready to join a group, but for sure they need to get into counseling, and they also also need to um, acknowledge that their family members are their team members too, and it's not just them doing it, and have them look at it a little more broadly. But if you can collect a team, the physician, the psychologist, the physiatrist, you have a team, then you have a chance. But if you're just trying to do it on your own, then I think the prognosis is uh, is not as good for someone who is isolated in an in, in island and doesn't have anybody to support them. They're more likely to just roll up and not come out. So how, we, we, we talked before about this difficulty of assessing a success, let's say, mm -hmm. in terms of your, your treatment and your, when, when you get this person, how do you define the success? How often do you succeed? Well, I guess it does depend on the, the definition of, of success. Um, but if we mean helping the kid get back to school and be successful in school or get back to work and be successful in, in, at work, it depends on the degree, the severity of the injury. But with a mild TBI, it's probably, I don't know, what do you think, like 50-50 at best? I would, well, 
uh, yeah, again, it's hard to give a number if it you is. can't set your where your data is. I, I think there's a lot of people that are helped much more when they can be followed along and directed. And so I would guess the success rate higher than that if you're looking at helping them deal and cope with their injury. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you say success rate where you're not going to have a divorce or something like that, that's hard to say. I have patients that eight years I saw a couple struggle back and forth and, and get through the roughest part and then they break up eight, nine years later. And, and, and it's hard to judge because I haven't had to live with this person with the brain injury. Right. Yeah, I think, uh, let's talk a little bit about now, um, you're gonna advise, and I, I bet you a meeting with uh, the chairman of the Senate Health Committee, um, and, and they wanna know, what can we do? What would you say to them? What could we do? What could the legislature do? to help TBI patients? Uh, I would think making it somehow mandatory for insurance companies to cover things like neuropsychiatric testing, um, not having closed uh, numbers of therapy sessions that you know, are just, okay, you'll get 12 sessions and you're done, like you had mentioned before, and now you've got to be well. Well, the human body is not like that. Um, and so, especially in this arena, where there's such a huge, um, uh, there's such a huge um, range of, uh, you know, some people can do therapy for a couple of months and they're fine, and others may need an entire year. Um, I think it would be helpful if we had some uh, more flexibility with insurance companies in looking at specific cases and, you know, being able to extend benefits. How about you, Mike? What would, what would your advice be to the senator? Boy, I, I could go on for a lot of different yeah. ones. I mean, it would be, where do I start? But, you know, I think you would have to look at and saying, am I dealing with trying to get enough care for those with severe injuries or am I starting to look at more of the mild traumatic brain injury with the concussion? I think with the big push that we have going on right now, the majority of the injuries come from mild concussions. And if we look at youth alone, most of those come from traumatic injuries. So whether it's a motor vehicle accident, whether it's sports related. And right now they're pushing through um, a law, um, Assembly Bill 25, for concussions on sports where there's education. And I think right now that would be the biggest push. We're moving along. I think we need to get all, everyone on board with this um, law. And that would probably be my focus for our more mild traumatic. Okay, Dan, you're in the office and the senator says to you, you know, this is America. We have the right to be stupid, you know. Because you say, well, it's preventable, you know, you should take more care if you, you know, you didn't tell the coach you had a concussion, now you've had three. I mean, I, I got that actually from a lot of senators. So how, how, how can you, as a legislature, impose our will on people's behavior? Is that something you would, how would you answer that? Well, in a, for society's sake, we, we need to either impose some restrictions. Uh, we've done that with helmet laws. We've done that with uh, uh, seat belts, airbags, things like that that are all trying to uh, decrease uh, injuries in car accidents. And uh, they're not always well taken uh, by the individual, but by society. The, um, the loss of financing, uh, each individual head injury can cost uh, an extreme amount of money. Then that person's lost uh, productivity to society and uh, and such. So um, sometimes we need to limit uh, people's freedoms, I guess, in some way. Uh, education would be a huge way to to help prevent that. Without restricting people, you educate them. Say this is the outcome of what can happen with, uh, especially with kids, because they're they're the most susceptible to head injury. They're involved in a lot of activities that can lead to head injury. They also think that they're indestructible. And uh, having education um, to, pre to allow the person to actually make the decision to prevent risky behavior would be uh, very important. So you've got about two minutes left. What would you say to the senator? Well, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Goldsmith in terms of the education, because I think the more that we can, can have um, 
education out there about what is concussion or traumatic brain injury. And I think we're getting that to some extent with um, everything coming out about football. So I'm thrilled because every day we're reading a different article that's coming out talking about what is head injury, what does it look like, and now we have this subconcussive syndrome or chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So with this raised awareness, um, perhaps there, there will be some changes that come about that might help um, the public understand how prevalent it actually is. Again, I find that when I start talking to people and they say, oh yeah, well I did have a concussion and I did notice that I wasn't remembering things quite as well afterwards and well, and my brother, wow, he hit several trees on his motorcycle and he's been drinking <laughs> ever since and hasn't really been a part of the family. Maybe that's what happened. Maybe that's why he's a reclusive alcoholic. So by bringing that information to the forefront, maybe some, some awareness and changes will take place. Well, I want to thank my guests, Cindy, Dan, Mike, Neva. Thank you so much for coming on board. Um, and as I said to the audience, that this is a um, part two of a six-part series. We're going to talk about football, sports in uh, injuries. We're going to talk about pediatric uh, occurrences. We're going to talk about uh, the military and what's happening now with our uh, returning veterans from Iraq. It's just this incredible number of traumatic brain injuries. I want to thank the uh, crew um, today for your, your really good work. Uh, thanks to Gail uh, for directing and producing. and. Uh, you know, particularly for uh, Har Harley, the only producer pug in existence, who I go to for advice all the time. Uh, that's about all we have time for uh, next. Uh, until next time, this is uh, your host, Paul Manikuchi, saying bye bye.